All right, all right. This week, we're going to think about one of the sort of minor characters in the universe, so to speak. When we look at the the standard model of particle physics, all the basic building blocks of our universe, we see all the big names, the the stars of the show, like the quarks and the electron and all those things. But there's this this row along the bottom, and it's on the bottom because the 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 sort of mystery ones called the neutrinos. Um, why should we care about neutrinos? I think we should care about neutrinos because I think that they are possibly the most interesting particle in the okay. universe. Let's let's wind the story back a little okay. bit and ask where where did this notion of this neutrino thing come from? Sure. So we, we know that there's a, a kind of radioactive decay that's observed that's uh, called beta decay. Yep. And that's when a nucleus of an atom will uh, undergo an internal change and it spits out an electron or a positron, right? And uh, when people did measurements of the... Uh, the energy of the particles, right? So you can you can you've got the recoil of the nucleus, yep. and you've got the energy that the the electron is spat out at. You can add up the energies, and they they looked at it and they saw that each beta decay was slightly different, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes you saw the electrons speeding out, other times they were a little bit slower, a little bit faster, and people were actually worried that conservation of energy, mm. which holds in quantum mechanics, not in general relativity, but holds in quantum <laughs> mechanics. Uh, wasn't being obeyed, right? This was a major worry. There's a great book by, I must have mentioned this before, Poincare, 1905. And when radioactivity came on the scene, it was like, oh no, this is the end of, of conservation of energy. This this rock is just glowing yeah. for no reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, pe so one option, of course, is that uh, you're di you don't, don't have conservation of energy. The other option is is that you do have conservation of energy, but some of that energy disappeared somewhere in the sense that something carried away mm -hmm. the energy, that there was another particle involved that could carry away that energy, mm -hmm. but it didn't interact with the apparatus. Right. So I think it was Fermi who mm -hmm. proposed uh, that there was this additional particle called yep. the neutrino. And uh, from, it, from the start, it... it must be a very ghostly kind of neutrino because it, it avoided all of the detection apparatus, yeah. right? You could find the electron, you could find the nucleus, but where did this neutrino go? Right. right? Um, and it, it took a lot of detective work to actually find experiment, uh, experimental evidence for the neutrino a long time after beta decay was proposed mm -hmm. uh, because it was realized that this particle, when they first found it uh, and they measured its properties, they figured that it had... Well, they assumed it had no mass whatsoever, right? right. So, so we now know, we'll come to this in a moment, that it does carry a teeny amount of mass. Okay. It's also not charged. It doesn't carry electric charge. Yeah. So that means it doesn't interact via the electromagnetic force. Right. So that's why your detectors, which can pick up the charged electron, uh, couldn't see it. And right, so it goes, it goes towards an atom... And there's the protons and uh, electrons that are charged, but it doesn't feel any of that. So no. it can just shoot straight no. on past. It it only interacts via the weak force. Right. So it's produced by a, a weak interaction, something due to the weak force inside the nucleus. And it only interacts with other particles that are in a weak interaction. So right. it, it can interact with electrons and quarks because okay. they b both undergo weak interactions. But the magic word, the cross-section for these interactions is really, really, really tiny. Right. So the cross-section is just if we think of these little, uh, you know, here's a proton and here's an electron. Um, you know, we think of them, you know, we think of an electron, for example, as a point particle. Yes. But actually, when you sort of throw something at it, it acts as if it has a certain size. It has size. a target yeah, size. target size. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. And so, you know, the... Um, the, the sort of standard uh, sort of idea people talk about is that if you have a neutrino, then essentially you need to fire it through about one light year's worth of lead right. to have a probability that it will interact with one of the lead atoms right. in that thing. So, okay. so uh, we now know that there are copious numbers of neutrinos in the universe. Right? Okay. The sun produces neutrinos. Uh, in its nuclear reactions, they have weak interactions that yeah. spit out neutrinos. Yep. Those neutrinos stream straight out of the sun. Light takes, you know, 100,000 years bouncing around to get to the surface and then eight minutes to get to us. Yep. Neutrinos travel straight from the center of the sun to us, straight through the earth, mm -hmm. straight through us. There are millions of neutrinos passing through us every second. Right. 
the wonderful thing is if you are patient enough and you have a big enough detector, you can actually detect these. Yes. So we have taken a neutrino photo of the sun, haven't we? Yes. That's lovely. Oh, That's it, beautiful. It is a beautiful thing. And, of course, you, you, know, you don't even have to be facing the sun to take that picture, right? Because, <laughs> because the neutrinos stream through the Earth. Yeah. Your detector can be on the opposite side, mm-hmm. and you can still pick up the neutrinos from the sun. That's so neutrino detectors now, um, which can detect the direction from which a neutrino comes, can collect neutrinos that have traveled all the way through the Earth and uh, arrive at the detector. Right. So it's just okay. pretty cool. Okay, so what are they actually, when, once they're sort of released into the universe, what, what are they doing around the place that we might, that we might be interested in? Well, wh- one of the interesting things that was discovered in the 1990s is mm-hmm. that neutrinos actually have a tiny amount of mass. Ooh. I know this was discovered uh, in, a, in a rather strange way, in the sense that what was discovered is that neutrinos can change their spot. Okay. Right. So you mentioned that there were three different kinds of neutrinos at the bottom of the standard model of particle physics. Yeah. And there's actually one neutrino associated with each of the leptons. So there's a, a neutrino associated with the electron, yeah. a neutrino associated with the uh, muon, mm-hmm. and a neutrino associated with the tauon. Yeah. So they're different kinds of neutrinos. Okay. This, they have different quantum numbers which affects the way they interact. Mm-hmm. What was discovered in... in uh, and actually, I'm trying to remember back when I heard about this the first time, and I thought about it. This is just just weird, but it's quantum it mechanical. Very weird, yeah. so what was weird is that neutrinos can change from one kind of neutrino to another kind. So, and without interacting with anything, without else. interacting with anything, just as else. they travel, uh, just as they travel. Weird. Yeah, so this is called mixing. Right. Okay. And um, we pick up a quantum book. I mean, it's just one of those bizarre <laughs> things. But it. It only happens if neutrinos have mass mm-hmm. and have mass differences between right. the, the various neutrinos. So we now that know that neutrinos have a teeny amount of mass, and it mm-hmm. really is really small. For m- most intents and purposes, you can treat them as being massless, like photons. But they have mass, and mm-hmm. they're heading out into the universe. Mm-hmm. So there was a, a suggestion for a while that maybe these neutrinos could be dark matter, right? Yeah. They have all of the right properties, right? They, ha- they, they don't interact with other matter. Yeah. They don't um, radiate light or anything. They travel out into the universe. But I think what people realized that the neutrinos in the standard model just don't have enough mass. Even though there's a lot of them, they don't have enough mass to be an appreciable amount of total mass in the universe. Okay, so how, how do we put those pieces together? So we want to know... Uh, you know, how can we do a survey of how many neutrinos are out there, and what would happen if if neutrinos were dark energy, uh, dark matter? <laughs> we always do that. Yeah. What would happen if neutrinos were dark matter? Well, um, it, it's kind of kind of cool, right? Is that while they only carry a little bit of mass mm-hmm. in the early universe, they played their part, right. right? So there was a lot of them around, and actually, uh, without going into too many details, the the number of neutrino species right gets imprinted onto the large scale structure of the universe mm-hmm. so it sound, sounds very weird but we can actually account for the neutrinos in the universe by looking at the distribution of galaxies across the sky yeah and looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation etc and people have actually measured that and it, it turns out that um the, the the standard neutrinos as we know them seem to be mm-hmm. seem to be the the only neutrinos that are in the universe. Right. But there are proposals for these things called sterile neutrinos. Okay. So these are like additional members of the neutrino family, mm-hmm. right? We're not sure how we sort of jerry them into the standard model. <laughs> yeah, yeah there doesn't seem to be a spot for it. It doesn't right, seem to be yeah. a spot. But we know that the standard model can't be complete. Sure. Right? Then this is what ideas like supersymmetry and all these are trying to envisage that you can unfold the standard model to be have more particles right. that somehow you fold in these sterile neutrinos which might be chubbier versions of the standard neutrinos and they could be dark matter candidates right and the question is is how they behave right right do they zip around the universe mm-hmm. or are they big and slow and sluggish right right because that also influences how galaxies form so so there's a way sort of roughly of thinking about this if you have a if you have something that has no mass light. 
So it's energy then. There's there's no e equals mc squared bit of its energy because its mass is zero. So Einstein's famous formula. And so kind of its its energy is is a, here's a hand wavy way of saying it. its energy is entirely in its motion. And so if you have light, it always goes at the speed of light mm-hmm. when there's no matter around through through empty space. Um, if you have a fixed amount of energy and then you start making, you, you make a particle with energy and you start making the particle heavier and heavier, more of that energy goes into the mc squared equals mc squared term. And so it comes out of the, the, uh, the energy of motion. So the same amount of energy will make a heavy particle move more slowly. Mm-hmm. The reason that's important is as we look at the structure in the universe, we need um, dark matter to hang around be nice and slow so that it collapses so it helps our galaxies form if it zips around like light at light speed then it will it won't help things collapse it'll just spread out yeah. and actually inhibit things from collapsing yeah yeah and and rather perversely well, the way people talk about this is they talk about it in terms of a temperature yeah yeah so mm-hmm. uh, zippy dark matter that's hot dark matter yeah and sluggish dark matter that's cold dark matter yeah. and you can have tepid Dark matter, yeah, warm dark, warm dark yeah, matter yeah. in the middle. So, so, so we don't know. Right? We we do not know what dark matter is, um, and there there are still proposals that ster- sterile neutrinos, something that we fold out of the standard model along the lines of the neutrinos that we see, yeah. um, might be a dark matter candidate. Okay, but this that's not the most interesting thing about neutrinos. Mm-hmm. So the most interesting thing about neutrinos, I think, is one of the most underappreciated scientific discoveries of uh, the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Uh, got a Nobel Prize in 1956 mm-hmm. for Yang and Li uh, from an experiment done by, by Wu. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to understand this, there, there's some, some beautiful books on this. We, we, we've spoken about symmetry, yep. right? And about how, how symmetry comes in. And there's different ways of thinking about symmetry. And um, in related to symmetry, there's this thing called parity. Okay. Okay. It's it's a quantum mechanical operation, mm-hmm. right? And it's assumed a, a, a way of thinking about it is um, uh, parity is this thing whereby uh, if you have an interaction takes place, particles interact, and you look at that particle interaction in the mirror, mm-hmm. and the question is. That interaction I see in the mirror, can it occur in the universe? Yeah. Right? And if you look at anything to do with the electromagnetic force, the strong force, or gravity, mm-hmm. anytime you hold a mirror up to the universe, what you see in the mirror, you could actually play out in our universe. Right. So this is the way a lot of these symmetries work. So yeah. symmetry in space is this interaction happened here. Could it happen over there? Uh, in time versus time of translation, it happened today. Could it happen yesterday? The, mo- the really interesting one is it happened this way in time. Could it happen if I hit rewind? That's a really interesting one. But uh, so this parity one's just the in the mirror yes. symmetry. Yeah. Okay. So what uh, Yang and Lee did is they looked at the weak interaction. Remember mm-hmm. the weak interaction is how you create neutrinos. And they said, ah, there's no indication here that the weak interaction obeys parity. Right. They basically said that Maybe it violates parity in the sense that uh, you have a, a weak interaction in our universe and you look at it in the mirror and you see an interaction that we don't see in the lab. Right. And this is what Wu tested when she, w- she was looking at um, uh, radioactive decay of cobalt, yep. I believe it was. And what they did is they chilled the cobalt down and cobalt nucleus spins. Mm-hmm. So you put it in a magnetic field, so you get all the cobalt nuclei spin in the same way and you get beta decay. So it spits out electrons yep. and... And uh, neutrinos. Okay, what you see is that the neutrinos come out in a particular direction. Let's say out of the top, yep. so aligned with the spin. Now, if we look in the mirror, what that does is you flip the direction of spin, right? Yep. And so then, what that means is that in the mirror, what you set thought was electrons coming out the top, and now electrons coming out the bottom. Yeah. And we don't see that. We only see electrons coming out the top, yep. which means the neutrinos coming out the bottom. And so that means that in the mirror, we see a reaction that doesn't occur in our universe. And it was realized that this comes about because neutrinos only spin one way. Right. Light can spin this way and that way, right? So your it travels. It can uh, can spin this way, that way. Neutrinos only spin one way, which means they can only be spat out in one direction. We don't know why. 
Yeah. We don't know why neutrinos do this. The way we usually talk about this is you put your thumb in the direction of travel and then as it spins this way, you have a right-handed particle or a left-handed particle. Yeah. All neutrinos are left-handed. All neutrinos are left The left yeah. hand of the universe. So they, it, it gets rid of this notion. And, and, and again, it, it took me 10 years to really appreciate this, I think, that this thing that seems so, so obvious that yeah. a, a mirror version of the universe looks like the universe doesn't hold for yeah. neutrinos and i think uh, uh, there's something deep there i don't know what the answer is but there's something about the universe buried in that certainly these symmetries are uh we, we expect the universe to be symmetric because you know that would be very nice and it, it's always a real shock when it when something like this turns up and it yeah. turns out not to be we think there must be some deeper reason for it and this is where we're stuck at the moment we yeah. don't know why absolutely